Okay, so episode 5 opens with a similar montage to the one seen in the actual episode 5, with the common people hiding in their homes, the Lannister soldiers manning the Scorpions, Euron and the Iron Fleet outside Blackwater Bay. A portion of the Golden Company's foot soldiers are positioned just outside the Red Keep as a last resort to protect Cersei, while Harry Strickland and the cavalry, because yes, they have horses, as said in episode 1. I guess the ND just kind of forgot. The main Golden Company forces are positioned outside the city gates. Now you might be wondering why on earth would anyone go outside the gates? The same reason Ramsay did. The Seven Kingdoms are watching. Hiding behind the gates like cowards makes you look weak and Cersei knows that. She also knows that if you take down the dragons, the Golden Company could definitely stand a chance of beating the tired allied forces. We have the same stare down as we did in the original episode. This is being intercutted with Jaime sneaking into King's Landing. He takes one last look at Tyrion and Brienne just outside the battlefield. He walks through the main gates. Jon and Danny are nowhere to be seen. We cut to Euron and his Iron Fleet. They are searching the skies for dragons and as the music builds, the ships around him begin to rumble. Bubbles start to appear in the water. Boom. Drogon bursts through from underneath and flies up straight through one of Euron's ships, decimating a significant portion of them. Yes, dragons can go underwater, just look at the scene from season 3. He orders all the scorpions to turn to Drogon just as Rhaegal and Jon fly from above and burn a few more ships. Euron turns tail and abandons ship, but not before he sees Greyjoy and Dornish flagged ships in the far distance. We then get to the montage of Danny burning down the scorpions. They are accurate though and we do get some near misses. Strickland hears the explosions and orders his cavalry to charge. The Dothraki and the Knights of the Vale charge at the Golden Company. Some of the horses are taken down by archers and scorpions which do a ton of damage, wiping out multiple riders at once. The two forces hit each other, the battle has begun. The allied forces are at a disadvantage as the scorpions are doing a lot of damage. The fighting is furious and brutal, similar in style to the Battle of the Bastards and the Battle of Pelennor Fields in Return of the King. Riders are knocked off their horses, horses hitting other horses. We see a Lannister soldier aiming his scorpion at Brienne and the Hound who are back to back, cutting down many enemies. Before he can shoot, he hears a screech. Rhaegal and Jon fly towards the scorpion, incinerating them, but one turns in time and fires a bolt through Rhaegal's wings. He opens his mouth, screeching, and another bolt goes straight through his mouth as he is about to breathe fire, causing him to implode. He falls onto the scorpion platform and Jon gets knocked off. He looks at a dying Rhaegal, who then gets brutally finished off by another bolt. He turns and draws his sword on the remaining Lannister men, cutting through them with rage. One is about to strike him from behind, but he is killed by a spear thrown by Grey Worm. The two exchange a nod. With the scorpions down, he calls his men to bring out the ram. The Unsullied and Stark men create a formation around the ram as they did with Melisandre in the real episode 3. Strickland orders his cavalry to charge at the ram, but the Unsullied hold strong. They fought off giants. Grey Worm sees Strickland and goes for him, picking up a spear lodged in a dead body and throws it straight at Strickland who dodges. He picks up another spear and they fight. It's evenly matched, but Grey Worm eventually gets knocked off his feet. Strickland prepares to deliver the final blow, but is stabbed in the back by Davos who helps Grey Worm up. Eventually, they manage to break down the gates. Jon meets them on the other side as we get a shot similar to this, but with Brienne and the Hound as well. Structurally, I'm going to say this all happens in around 25 minutes to half an hour, putting us just under halfway through the episode. Now, one of the main differences I will make in this battle is that the Queen is the only one who can give the order to ring the bell. So as long as she doesn't, the fight continues. We see Cersei in the same position as episode 5, looking down at the battle. She sees Daenerys on Drogon taking out all the scorpions. The allied forces are getting uncomfortably close to the Red Keep. There are, however, very few left as they are clearly outnumbered against the remaining Golden Company and Lannister soldiers. Cersei realises the battle might not go in her favour as Drogon still lives. She orders the Pyromancer to carry out their plan and set off the wildfire. The Mountain sees his brother fighting from a distance and walks off. Cersei calls him back but he gives it the same look he does in the actual episode 5 and takes out Kyburn in the same way. We see him walking down the stairs, the camera pulls back to reveal Jaime. He continues to go up the Red Keep but hears something, he draws his sword and turns around. It's Arya. He asks her what she is doing here and she replies, I'm here to kill the Queen in case you can't convince her to end this madness. She walks away from him but he says he knows a quicker way. They walk together and as a small moment of appropriate fan service, you can have Arya walk past the room where she used to train with Cereal. They get to the stairs leading up to Cersei's chambers but four Kingsguard are standing there. Arya and Jaime draw their weapons and fight. She kills three of them with relative ease and turns around to see Jaime fighting one. He uses his metal hand to knock the Kingsguard in the windpipe. The guard gets knocked back straight into Needle. 
The tall guard falls and reveals Aya. They go up the stairs, but before they enter, he asks her to wait outside. She agrees. Jamie enters to find Kyburn's dead body on the floor and Cersei turns around, silent. A part of her seems gone. He tells her to ring the bells and she says, I guess you still are the stupidest Lannister. Jamie replies, look down there, your men are dying, your people are dying. She firmly says, fuck everyone who isn't us, we're the only ones who matter, repeating this line from season one. As she finishes, a green explosion occurs behind her. She turns around and you can see the wildfire in her eyes. A mirror of this shot from episode 3. Jamie has the same look as he had at the end of season 7. We cut to the battlefield, Jon sees explosions and commands Davos and a portion of his Northmen to get the citizens to safety. They run into a bunch of Lannister soldiers doing the same and after a quick but tense stare off, they walk together to help the commoners escape. We cut back to some fighting and get a shot of the Hound fighting as he turns and sees his brother lifting up a Dothraki and snapping his neck with one hand. They have an intense and brutal fight which is being intercutted with Davos, the Starks and the Lannisters getting the commoners out and Danny getting the people onto Drogon to fly them to safety. Davos is getting a family out and the woman says their daughter is still in the house. He rushes in and finds the daughter as the house is on fire. He carries her out as a pile of rubble falls in front of him. He hands the girl over to a Lannister soldier who runs to bring her to her parents. He climbs over the rubble but another cache of wildfire explodes, blowing up Davos as well. Another issue I had with episode 5 was no real good guys actually died during the fight. I thought it would be a nice way to Davos to die here as his son also died by wildfire and so did he. The main difference here is that he saved the little girl from burning, something he wasn't able to do with Shireen. Jon sees the building blow up next to Davos and realises the fate of his friend and advisor. What we get next is what I like to call a losing montage. Slow motion shots of the main characters mid-battle as it looks like all hope is lost. We see Jon looking around at the chaos, Lannister soldiers lifting children up to Danny on Drogon to save them. Similar to the battle against the dead, there are no more sides between most of the humans, they're simply fighting for life. The Hound is losing his fight against the mountain, he has been beaten and stabbed quite a few times, but in one last mad effort drives his sword straight through the mountain's heart. The mountain grabs the sword and slowly pulls it out and throws it away. The hound sees a sword by a nearby burning house and rushes to it, struggling to find his footing. The mountain follows. The hound must overcome his fear of fire to grab the sword. He turns around and sees his brother walking towards him. He grabs the sword and in one final swing, cuts the mountain's head clean off. He lays down, tired, defeated, but also victorious. The slow motion and dramatic music continue to Jamie and Cersei. She is unfazed, but he is so much more conflicted than he has ever been. He sees Brienne fighting down below, screaming in pain as she gets stabbed in the collarbone. The look on Jamie's face is indescribable. I'm talking season 7, episode 7 levels of face acting by Nikolai Kosovald out here. He slowly grabs Cersei, he puts his hand on her stomach, kisses her and slowly reaches for his dagger. He stabs her and she falls onto the ground. This shot will be very similar to the one between Jon and Egret. She looks at him realizing that she has truly lost as she has lost the two things most important to her, Jamie and her child. Tears come down from her eyes as she shows emotion for the first time in a long time. Jamie is tearing up as well but regains composure. He looks up towards the bells as Arya walks in. They exchange a look. We cut to some more fighting. The Greyjoy and Dornish forces have gotten ashore and engage in a fight with Euron and his remaining men who have swam ashore. Yara and Euron are fighting, the fighting outside the Red Keep stops as the bells sound in a moment of cathartic silence. Everyone stops. They look around at each other. Euron refuses to stop and hits Yara, only to hear Cersei say, Euron, stop. He turns around to look at her for a second and gets stabbed in the back by Yara. His body falls to the floor to reveal Arya, wearing Cersei's face. The streets of King's Landing are on fire, but the battle is over. Jaime made his decision. Danny lands on the Red Keep with Drogon. She sees Jon and starts tearing up, realizing Rhaegal is gone. Arya walks up to a dying Sandor. She kneels by his side, wiping the blood off one eye in a shot that resembles this one from season 4. He puts his hand on her face and asks her to kill him. She says thank you and stabs him in the heart with Needle, a mercy killing. Jaime helps Brienne up as Danny and Jon walk past them and then past Grey Worm and the Unsullied. They are all done with war, with death. The two walk into the throne room, still intact. They get to the Iron Throne and look at each other. We get a wide shot of the two with the Iron Throne in the middle. The camera slowly moves back as the screen fades to black.
For the first time in Game of Thrones history, we have text saying one year later. We also open with the same way season one, episode one did, with a shot of the gates of the wall opening. Jon and Arya are in the tunnel, his daughter fastened to his back. Sam and Sansa are in the tunnel with them. They bid their friend and family good luck, and the two ride out beyond the wall. This will also be the first time in Game of Thrones history where we have a non-linear structure, with the present events being intercutted with the past. Once Jon and Arya ride out, we cut back to the same shot from the end of episode 5, with Danny and Jon in the Iron Throne. Varys and Tyrion walk in. They address the fact that there is only one Iron Throne, and Tyrion says that there are enough swords for another one, and a dragon to melt the swords together. Jon says for the first time, and the only time in the season, I don't want it, I never have. It's your birthright, Varys says. It doesn't matter, one Targaryen on the Iron Throne is enough. I may know how to lead men into battle, but I don't know how to run a country, says Jon. Tyrion says, what do you want? And Jon replies, peace. Safety for our child and all the men and women and children to come. Tyrion names Daenerys Queen of the Seven Kingdoms as she slowly but surely sits down on the Iron Throne. We get triumphant music and the shot cuts too. Jon and Arya are in the woods back in the present day, talking around a campfire. She has her niece in her arms. The scene lasts for a couple minutes. We cut back to Daenerys in a crowded throne room, surrounded by her allies. She names Sansa, Lady of Winterfell. She thanks Yara for her sacrifice and the sacrifice of her brother, naming her Lady of the Iron Islands. She names Grey Worm her Master of War. She gives the Reach to House Tarly with Sam's mother as the new Lady of Highgarden, and has some small talk with the Dornish. Finally, her eyes wander across the room to find Jaime, standing in the corner with Brienne. We then cut back to Sam at the wall in the present. He walks up to the elevator of Castle Black and goes up. We go back to Danny in the past who asks Jamie to come forward, thanking him for his service and sacrifice, offering to name him Lord of Castle Rock. To everyone's surprise, Jamie refuses it, saying with confidence, I wish to be sent to the wall. Everyone is shocked, none more than Tyrion and Brienne. Jamie continues, For most of my life I have fought for selfish reasons, putting my wants and needs over my duty. I wish to spend the rest of my days serving with pride and honour, swearing an oath and keeping it. A triumphant version of the Lannister theme plays as Danny agrees, naming him Lord Commander of the Night's Watch as Sam reaches the top of the wall in the present day to find Jaime on top with a properly fortified wall, archers and rangers stretching as far as the eye can see. Now I imagine this might be the most divisive decision I've made so far, and I actually initially considered keeping Jorah alive so he could take after his father as Lord Commander, but I think it's a nice conclusion to Jaime's arc as he has gone from the Oathbreaker to the Oathkeeper. I understand many wanted him to die alongside Cersei in some way they came into the world together and they should die together, but I felt this was a more meaningful conclusion to his arc. I also get that it doesn't fulfil his wish to die in the arms of the woman he loves, but he still very much loves Brienne, and although the romantic side may not be possible, there is still very much love there, and who knows, in the future, he could die in Brienne's arms. We then cut back to Sansa as she walks out of Castle Black where Brienne is waiting. They walk into the field just behind the wall to see hundreds of thousands of soldiers gathered together. The Unsullied, Dothraki, Knights of the Vale, Highgarden, Lannisters, Dornishmen, Ironborn, Gendry and the Baratheon Bannermen. Properly lit trenches dug with siege weapons at the back and Drogon scanning the skies. The armies of the Seven Kingdom united for the first time, waiting to possibly face this threat together. We cut back to the past in Winterfell as we see Gendry finishing the sword, which we will call Lightbringer, as Melisandre begins to start chanting in Valyrian or whatever language she speaks. Specifically stating that Jon could do it to Danny or the other way round. After this is done, she walks out into the snowy plains of Winterfell, taking off her necklace as she slowly perishes like she does in the real episode 3. The next scene is what I would describe as the Game of Thrones equivalent of Hawkeye and Black Widow scene on Vormir, with the two Targaryens by the Weirwood Tree arguing over who dies. Tyrion and Sansa stand at a distance at the edge of the Godswood. Danny says to Jon that during her time at the House of the Undying, she saw the Red Keep covered in ruins and snow. She believes that this is the fate of the world if she lives. After a heated debate, Jon says that he does not know how to lead a country. He is a military leader, not a politician. If Danny dies, no one will be able to rule. There is, she says, and slowly turns to Sansa. 
She will rule as queen until our daughter comes of age. She will teach her the ways of ruling, the value of compassion, and of strength. And she will have a tremendous hand to guide her. She and Sansa exchange a look of trust and mutual respect. The same applies to Tyrion. Jon kisses Daenerys and she kisses their daughter. He puts his hand on her face, both are crying as he begins to draw the sword. Jon plunges the sword through her heart. The blade sets on fire and shatters. Only the small, broken part lodged inside her remains. He pulls it out and it is the shape of a dagger. Drogon flies down to caress his mother. He moves on to Jon and his daughter, sad but still with purpose. He knows who he must now protect. We then cut to the present with Jon and Arya approaching the lands of always winter. He gives his daughter a kiss as he and Arya look at each other before advancing into the cold wastelands. Back at the wall, Sansa and Tyrion stand on a hill parallel to the army and discuss Daenerys' achievements and how they'll move forward from here on out. Brienne and Podrick behind them in Queen's Guard armor. Tyrion turns to Pod and says, I don't suppose you have another song, do you? He begins singing a new and awesome song as we get our final shots of many of the characters. Yara, Grey Worm, Tyrion and Sansa, Brienne looking up at the wall, a moment of connection between her and Jaime who is looking down at the army below. He and Sam then turn to the north as Drogon flies past, sending us into one last flashback. Danny's funeral. Podrick continues to sing. Now this could either be Podrick singing or a new and awesome piece of music by Ramin Jawadi. Both would work. As the music comes to a close, we get Jon and Arya approaching the Night King's palace. Viserion rises from the ice in a shot almost identical to this one from the actual finale, as White Walkers approach to escort him. Arya is nowhere to be seen. Jon walks into the throne room and he puts the long clothes down. He looks at the Night King, menacing but calm. He brings his daughter to the table in the middle of the room, placing her down. The Night King theme, or a new theme, continues to build. Jon and the Night King share one more look as his hand reaches out to the child. Suddenly, Arya appears from a side entrance or something, bolting straight towards the Night King. He turns and sends a spike of ice to freeze her mid-air as Jon pulls out the Lightbringer dagger and stabs the Night King straight in the heart. He shatters. The White Walkers shatter. The ice hauling Arya shatters. Viserion falls apart. Arya lands on the ground hurt, but not fatally. Jon helps her up and picks up his daughter. They get on their horses and Arya rides out of frame. As the skies in the north begin to clear and the sun begins to shine, Jon looks up at the north, and then back down at his daughter with catharsis. He slowly rides out of frame. His journey has ended, and so has Game of Thrones. So guys, that was my rewrite for season eight. It was a really fun project and I got to collaborate with one of my friends, which was a lot of fun. I hope you find some enjoyment from my version. Hopefully don't hate it too much. I think I managed to wrap up the storylines quite nicely while also maintaining that bittersweet ending that Martin promised.